Welcome to Whitetail Rendezvous Podcast. This is Bruce Hutchin, host and executive producer. Each week you will hear tips, techniques, strategies, and personal stories from some of the best and funniest whitetail hunters in North America. Hope you enjoy today's episode. If you do, tell a friend on social media. If not, tell me and I'll make it better. Thanks for listening, folks. Today we're welcoming David Block from Outdoor Edge. David created Outdoor Edge in 1988, a few days ago, but he's taken uh, a couple ideas and uh, that he's had about building knives and building blades and building a company and has a very successful company. You see him on the uh, Pursuit Channel. He's one of the presenting sponsors uh, on the Pursuit Channel. Having said all that, I had an enjoyable time with David yesterday uh, talking about what it takes to make a good blade because we use the sharpest broadheads we can, but sometimes we don't put the same effort in, in picking the right blade to field dress our deer, take our deer apart, and then process our deer so it ends up on our table tasting really good. Well, David's going to do all that and tell us why, how, and where and give you a lot of specific information. So if you ever question yourself about knives and what's the right knife and how does it all work, well, David's got some answers for you. I think you're going to enjoy the show. Hey, folks, welcome to another edition of Whitetail Rendezvous. This is your host, and I'm joined by David Block up in Denver, Colorado, or Wheat Ridge, uh, to be exact. And David started a company back in 1988 called Outdoor Edge, and I've used some of their products. I have some of their products, and and a few months ago, I asked David. I said, you know, let's let's get you on the show and talk about knives because every time we put a a deer down, an elk down, a moose down, anything down, we got to take it apart. And quality knives take it apart, and that's why I wanted David to share today. And we're going to talk about hunting and and uh, school of mines and and some fun things. But David, welcome to the show, and, and let's just start off with you know where you were in 1988 yeah thanks thanks for having me here really a pleasure so um so yeah basically founded outdoor edge in 1988 and the um, birth of it was really it was my college project um i was going to colorado school of mines graduating in 80, 86 and for my senior design project uh it was basically to develop a new hunting knife and um our first knife was um don't have one handy. yeah i do look at this what do you know that's it right there that's the game skinner. And um, basically, it's a T-handle grip. So basically, you cut with a straight wrist and then um, added a gut hook on top where you basically cut forward, break the skin, pull back, and you could basically cut forward and back in one motion. Another nice thing about the T-handle is you can use both hands without setting down your knife. So this was our first knife and um, you know didn't know anything about the knife industry, hunting industry, and um, designed this as a school project. And uh, you know I don't know if if you know uh, Spyderco knives, well, they're located in Golden, and uh, I drove by Spyderco every day home from school, and actually uh, talked to a couple other knife companies in the U.S. and found out I couldn't have my knife made here, and Spyderco referred me to very competent quality manufacturers in Japan. And uh, 1988, I went to the Shot Show in Vegas with six prototypes of my knife, and uh, and that was the launch of it. I'll, t- I'll tell you one funny story: is uh, my first. Sh- Second show after the SHOT Show was Wisconsin Deer Classic in um, St. Paul. And I had my knife. I had a booth set up. And I'm showing the knife. And this guy goes, what do you do? I go, what do you, well, what do you mean? He goes, what do you do for a living? I said, uh, you know, I started out to edge. I have this knife. And I'm selling this knife. And he goes, let me tell you, you can't make a living at that. And I said, well, I guess I don't want to talk to you anymore. So kind of ended the conversation. And and uh, he was right. I couldn't I couldn't actually make a living off one knife. So I made another one and another one. And here we are almost 30 years later. And um, we have about 120 different products in the line and built a very successful business. So uh, very, very, very blessed. And it's been a been a great run. You know, when, when you when you hear about knives in Japan and everything, just talk a little about the steel and the difference of your steel versus somebody else's because this is critical because how the hardness or whatever you correct me but to to tune it back up to to reset the edge is critical to all us hunters so oh talk to me about that you know it's um i know we have have so much so much time but i'll, I'll say that 
you know, every knife has a blade and has a handle. And then everything in between there, it's all small details. So the thing is, is there's so many steps and so many small details that going into making a good knife. Yes, every knife has a has a blade and a handle, but as far as the steel, steel is one thing. Grinding is one thing. Geometry, blade blade grinding geometry, final edge geometry. Um, steel steel is one thing. Heat treatment is everything. You can take the best steel known to man. If you don't heat treat it correctly, it won't be sharp. It won't take an edge, and it, and it won't it'll be difficult to resharpen. So um, so basically, it's kind of like oh, let's say like a, a baking recipe. You know, you take uh, you take um, you know steel is basically you take it's made up of iron. Um, you have stainless steel. You have high carbon steels. It's basically a cookbook recipe where you take different elements of of uh, you know. Iron is the number one uh, thing that makes a steel. And then you have uh, carbon, you know, carbon content. So, you know, the higher the carbon content, the harder and stronger the steel is. The also, it also makes it um, uh, rust more. So the higher carbon, more performance, but also easier to rust. Um, also harder, so, um, you know, more uh, harder to grind and, and harder to work. So, um, so, so steel is one thing. So you take all these elements, you kind of, Put it together. Let's say you're making making bread, and then you put it in the oven. So, if you don't cook it long enough, it's all mushy. The bread's no good. And if you overcook it, it's all dry and crumbly. So, same thing with steel. If you follow the right heat treatment process, all the grains and molecules um, form correctly, and you get uh, proper grain structure. The um, the knife will be strong. It'll be flexible. It'll um, take an edge and uh, be razor sharp, and then also easy easy to sharpen. So. Um, so again, lots of lots of small details. So it's not just any one thing. It's it's a little bit of everything. And then I'll also say there's there's no perfect knife. You know what what is the knife used for? If you go to a, a Cabela's or Bass Pro, there's there's a, maybe a thousand different knives, and they're all for different uses. That you know is it for chopping? You know if you have a chopping knife, it should be more blade heavy for more impact. Um, for skinning knife, you know we do a lot with skinning knives. It's about it's about balance, and you want the center of balance right in the middle of your hand because you do a lot of arcuate motion. So if it's a chopping tool, it's more blade heavy. And every time you, you go to cut, it's cumbersome. It's clunky in the hand. So you want to move that center point back into the middle of your hand, and then it flows a lot nicer. So, so really a lot of factors. Um, er- ergonomics of the grip. Um, all knives are hand tools. So when you go to a store and pick out a knife, you know, don't a lot of, a lot of knives are bought because, wow, that looks cool. That's, that's fancy. I like that. That's what I want. But it may not be a functional or practical knife. So I always Take a knife, you know, think of all the times when you, all the times, all the different grips when you field dress a gear. You're, you're choking up on the front of the knife or caping. You're getting on the back of it. Sometimes you flip it around and, and do inverted cutting. So I always check a handle and grip it every which way I can. I choke up on the blade. I grip behind it. I flip it around. Is it comfortable when you turn it around your hand? Is it easy to change grips on it? So ergonomics, the knife blade is the extension of your hand. Whatever you do with your hand has to easily transfer to that blade. If it does, it's going to cut better. So handles are something that's a little bit overlooked. When I design a knife, the handle has to be just perfect. It's kind of a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, we don't do big handles and small handles. I, I really focus on making one handle that's going to fit a small hand and fit a larger hand. So uh, lots of lots of small details. So, But that's that's really a you know, good tip for me to share with the listeners is um, you know, really analyze the knife. What are you going to use the knife for? And and look for the details in that knife that will make it perform for that application. Now, you mentioned about the carbon and then the iron. Do you ever use molybdenum um, yeah. for hardening? Yeah, molybdenum, it's, it's again... Um, is that how you say it? Uh, molybdenum, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> molybdenum is a, is a hardening and strengthening alloy that's added to steel. So, the thing is, is there's all different elements that are added to different steels. Steels is kind of, this is one of those topics where you can spend the whole show talking about steel. Um, so the thing is, is it's not so much what's in the steel. I mean, there is, it is important what's in the steel. It really comes down to the mechanical properties and the specs of that steel once this cookbook recipe is put together. So, um, you know, sulfur, carbon, molybdenum, phosphorus, um, vanadium, you know, vanadium is also used in tool steel. So um, depending on what the steel is, what it's used for, what the application is, um, there's no perfect knife. There's no perfect steel. There are steels that hold an edge longer than other knives. There are also sometimes that will make them, not sometimes, in most cases, that will make the, the, the knife very hard to resharpen. So I think it's very important for a hunting knife that um, it's sharp, 
it holds an edge. It's also flexible because a lot of times you put force into your knife um, and uh, you have to be able to put an edge back on it. If you can't sharpen it, um, you know, then really it's no good. It's all about sharp. So, you know, be sharp out of the box, stay sharp, and then also be easy to sharpen once it does go dull. And that's and great. great. Field to freezer. What does that mean? You know, that's that's kind of our tagline. You know, if there's any one uh, line that defines Outdoor Edge, I call Outdoor Edge the Field to Freezer Knife Company. So, um, you know, basically we have a variety of items. And really my goal as a company owner and designer is to make your job easier in the field. When you get a deer down, it's it's work. You know, as they say, that once, once you pull the trigger or, or release that arrow, the real work begins. And you need a knife that's designed for the job. It has the right shape and geometry. Um, it has good steel. It's razor sharp. It's going to hold an edge. And, um, you know, basically it's a tool to get the job done. And if you're stuck out there with, with a dull knife, you know, it's, it's just no fun. If it's sharp and it's, it's, it's ready to go, it makes it so much faster. You know, talking about, um, you know, the game that we put down, the game we harvest, um, let's talk about um, your hunting experience and with your knives. And I guess I want to know, what is your go-to knife when you're out in the field yourself? So, you know, I got to say that we don't make, there's, we don't make a bad knife. And I kind of, as we progress and come out with new knives, I always kind of move to the newest knife and the old one goes by the wayside. So, uh, uh, you know, my favorite knife right now is, is the Razor Pro. And the Razor Pro is basically, this is really the, you know, the hottest thing that we have going, um, not just from a sales standpoint, really from function. And, and what it is, it's a replacement razor blade knife. And, you know, here I did a lot of talking about really good steel that holds and adds and resharpening. So, so the thing is, we have a knife that, you know, another thing I mentioned is geometry. So what makes a razor blade cut so well? Thinness. So the fact that it's thin as you cut has much less friction as you're cutting. So it, so it cuts much easier. Just everyone's used um, utility razor blades. They cut good because they're thin. Another thing I was mentioned was, was blade geometry. So with a razor blade, because it's thin, you can get a very acute angle on the final edge. So that final edge, you know, if you put a very acute angle on a, on a standard knife, it, um, it tends to not hold an edge very good. But with a razor blade, since it's thinner, you're, you're able to grind it thinner. So that's what makes it sharper out of the box. And then if it does go dull, what you do is you push the button and you pop in a new blade. Now, the thing is, is you can replace the blade, but here's something that I really encourage people to do. This is, um, this is a draw-through sharpener that we make. It's, it's tungsten carbide and it's ceramic. And it has a, has a leg that folds out. It has this foot. It's called the Sharp X. And that, what it does, it gives you more stability. So um, here's really a tip, whether you're using a replacement blade knife or any knife, keep the knife sharp. So once, when the knife is razor sharp, when you're cutting, you know that where it really separates and the kind of skin just comes apart. When it's razor sharp, it just, once it starts going dull, you start using more force. As you put more and more force on your edge, the blade goes duller and duller. So a lot of guys, they really don't know how to sharpen. They don't sharpen and they just maybe have a really good knife. It's sharp. And then they get one deer, two deer, three deer, four deer. And the, they use it to the point where the edge is completely dull. Well, if you do that, you have a really tough sharpening job. You really have to take off metal and redefine the blade. My suggestion is, is keep the knife sharp. And just like a professional butcher, a butcher basically takes a knife and he'll use it all day. At the end of the day, he'll put it on a grinder and sharpen it. But during the day, what does he got? He's got a butcher steel and he's basically stealing the knife every five minutes. And steel is a flexible, pliable um, material. And basically that final edge is thin. And that's what makes it sharp. And the edge is bending around, it's moving. So by putting it on the steel, you're straightening the edge, you're keeping it straight. So even if you're using a razor blade or a, a non-replaceable blade knife, every five minutes, stop and draw through the fine stones. And you're not taking off any metal here. What you're doing is keeping the edge aligned. And your edge, will it'll hold an edge twice, three times as long. And you really won't, won't replace any blades. You know, actually, even though we sell replaceable blade knives, if you sharpen them, you really won't replace them. It's so easy to sharpen again because it's thin. So, um, so there's a little tip there. Keep them sharp and then tune up, tune up your knives. And again, angle is really important. So with a sharpener like this, it has a preset angle. So anybody can use it. So you don't have to be skilled at sharpening. Just draw it through and it gives you the exact angle. So another cool thing about this knife that I really like is you have a replacement razor blade knife. And then um, I don't know if uh, any of your viewers out there are familiar with the swing blade, but this is the coolest gutting blade out there. It's a banana shaped blade. So it curves up. 
But what it does, it cuts underneath the skin. By cutting underneath the skin, it it doesn't cut any hair. And you just push it and it just zips the animal right open. So so really a, a cool knife. You got knife on this side, close it, take out your gunning blade, open up the leg, open up the belly, go back to your your uh your skinning blade. So really a convenient system in one knife. Thanks for that. In, in the warm up, we're talking about uh, the Havilon blade. Sorry there. Uh, okay, I don't see it. Don't see it handy. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. Sorry, I'm back with you. Um, yeah, so Havilon, Havilon I got a lot of respect for the company. They, they make a great product. And they came on the market with their, their basically uh, replaceable scalpel blades. The background of Havilon is they're a medical supply company and they make some of the sharpest um, surgical um, scalpel blades um, available. And basically they put it into a, a folding knife, came on the market and had a really big success. Um, I looked at it and I heard a lot of you know, criticism where you know, basically the blades are about 0.4 millimeter thin, so they're not all that sturdy. They do flex really easy. So this is a really sharp knife. You have to use it very delicately. If you put any force to it, I've heard a lot of stories of blades snapping. Once they do snap, it's it's a bit challenging to change the blade. You have to flex the blade out of the way, and it's it's also very sharp there. You're close to the edge, so it's kind of dangerous system to change the blade. It's also the blades um, they're very easy to break. And then you know when you're working inside a body cavity, you have a broken blade in there. It's also kind of kind of scary having a having a sharp scalpel blade there trying to fish around and find it. So. So really, um, the, the goals when I came up with the with the razor light knife, I had two goals in mind. One was to make it strong. And what we did is we basically came up with a sandwich blade holder. This is three layers of stainless steel. And basically, it has all the stability of a, of a standard knife. So then you take your razor blade, put it in the holder, and you have this really rigid structure. So even though it's a razor blade, you can use it hard. You can push, twist, pry. Um, you know, we've never snapped a blade holder. It's just it's something where you have that razor blade sharpness, but also strength of a standard knife. And, you know, you do that with your good knife and actually use it hard or twist and damage your blade. Well, you just ruined your really good knife. Well, with ours, pop in a new blade and and uh, for about two dollars. So you're you're ready to go. So so that's one of the things that we achieve that makes this really different. Havilon is you have a much more stronger blade. You also have a lot, uh, you know, a bit longer blade length. Um, ours is a, a standard three and a half inch drop point blade where. You know, there's, it's, it's, it's really a delicate knife for, for fine work at the tip. Um, another major difference is changing the blade. I, you know, explained how you have to flex the blade out of the way to, uh, to remove it. And I'm, I'm really close to a, a, a sharp uh, scalpel edge here. With ours, basically, um, you have a, a push button lock on the side. So you basically push the button, now comes the blade, put it back in. So the, really, that was really two, two focuses with the razor light was make it strong. Make it safe and easy to change the blades. So when you go elk hunting um, or, or whitetail hunting, mule deer hunting, wherever you go, so do you just take one knife, or do you, like me? I I'm, I'll have a completely, you know, I'll have three different knives for three different jobs on the same animal. So generally, I, I like to go with two knives on on pretty much any hunt. Um, if I go on an elk hunt, I will bring extra knives. Uh, you know, I'm always going elk hunting with with a group of guys. And when you get one down, it's a lot of work. I mean, a deer is something that, you know, you can skin out, skin out a deer in, in 15, 20 minutes and drag, drag them out of the woods by yourself. Elk, a lot of times, you know, elk live where people don't. So they're remote, they're heavy, you know, they weigh several hundred pounds. And um, I generally like to debone all the meat, put it into to meat bags in the field and just carry out meat. Um, you know, it's, it's a big, heavy animal and it's just a lot of extra weight trying to carry out the bones. So so with that, I'll bring um, several knives so that, you know, basically um, my buddies all have knives. We're working on the animal together. And then um, another knife that I take with me on every hunt is a folding fillet knife. So, you know, fillet knives are all used by fishermen to fillet fish. Look at this as a, as a butchering knife. So this is something that weighs three ounces and you have basically a five inch um, butchering knife in your pack. I like this blade for cutting around the, the, the butt end of the animal to remove the, the anal canal there. And then just um, great for cutting out back straps, um, doing any deboning. So, so those two right there, that pretty much is is everything you need for any any um, whitetail hunt or any western elk remote packing hunt. Those those two knives will pretty much do it all. So if we put a moose down, we need a chainsaw, right? Chainsaws, you know, that's funny. Um, you know, the first time I heard that, I was talking to some guys from Sweden, and I was 
shown him this little handsaw that we made that goes in a, a, a nice saw comma called the Pody Pack. And I start laughing at me and go, no, no, no. And I go, what do you mean? No, it's it's saw. And it's like, no, no, we, we use chainsaws on moose. So I'm like, that's a really good idea. Chainsaw works much better than this. And so, so, so yeah, no, I actually was fortunate enough to go to the Yukon um, up the McMillan River Adventures and shot a, shot a moose there about seven years ago. And it was, you know, one of the things is, is just walking up on this massive 1400 pound animal and just the, you know, I've, I've shot a number of elk over the years and just the size of the back straps from, from a deer to an elk. And then when you get to the moose, everything is just goes uber big. I mean, they are just a massive animal. Um, that is where the real work begins after the shot is very true is when you get, get the moose on the ground and cut them up and pack them out. It's, you need, you need real gear and you need, you need some muscles to pack out that meat. There's plenty of it. A lot of, a lot of weight. Yeah. I, I just watched a video yesterday. They, they, uh, used a helicopter yeah. and they you know, yeah. took it apart. They had it all apart. So they reduced as much weight as they could. Then they flew the helicopter in and, and went off. That's one reason, folks, why moose hunting today is extremely expensive. Um, you know, but it saved them. You could say even days, depends how far back they were. You yeah. know, literally days, you know, in 45 minutes, an hour, he's back at camp. Yeah, I, re- I remember carrying out the, the quarters and just this solid dead weight on your shoulders. Like, I've never really carried anything so heavy as a, as a moose quarter. Unbe- unbelievable. Yeah. So tell me about Kansas. I, I tried to get myself invited, but I don't have a tag. So thanks. <laughs> thanks anyway, David. I can't go anyway, but tell me about what's going to happen to Kansas here pretty quick. So uh, Kansas, um, you know, I've been cutting Kansas for the past uh, 15 years or so. And um, hands down my favorite place to go whitetail hunting. It's, it really is, is awesome there. Um, you know, the cool thing about Kansas is, um, you know, I hunt in the northwestern part of uh, Kansas, and it's um, it's a lot of drainages. You know, you basically have have crop crop ground, and then you have you know fingers of drainages where you have the tree line. So, so the deer really do pattern down, um, you know, very concise corridors. So you see a lot of activity. And I've, and I've hunted in Illinois, and I've hunted um, Iowa, and I've hunted um, Ohio, and it's it's massive woods. It's big open woods, so the deer can pretty much go a little bit anywhere. And the cool thing about Kansas is, is it's more more funnels for for the animals. And uh, you know the um, the management out there. You know, I I um, have a place out there where we manage for for trophies. We let the the young uh, good looking bucks walk, and um, we you know let them grow up. And and pretty much all the neighbors also have the same philosophy. So um, so there really are some just great deer there. The genetics are great. The nutrition and the food out there, support source for them is is great, and it's just truly one of the one of the great places to go hunting. Yeah, my way to Wisconsin, I'm going to be traveling sort of kind of through that country, and uh, you know, I have a buddy right now at, uh, at he's hunting uh, Pittsburgh around the Pittsburgh area. That's where he's hunting, and uh, he's taken some wonderful, wonderful deer. And Phillips, Phil- 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 yeah, yeah, Phil- that's Phil- that's um. My farm's a half hour from there, and uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't know that, folks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's funny. Phillipsburg has has some awesome deer. I've got this is um the place that I hunt now. This guy, let's see. I guess that doesn't do him justice, but I shot him the first uh, forty minutes of hunting the property on the first day. Oh my goodness! So Couple I don't know. Them. Not a very good camera angle, but that's uh, all right. He's a big deer. Yeah. Widespread. Get good mass. Oh, did you get that picture of the buck at KO Farms? Um, I turned my phone off for the interview, so I didn't. Oh, get it. okay, okay, okay. You can look <laughs> at it afterwards. Yeah, it's the rut, folks, and you know I'm growing horns, and I, you know, <laughs> sooner or later I'm heading, I'm heading east to a couple of different farms, and and uh, hopefully I'm blessed to to see a couple of Mr. Wonderfuls. Uh, here, I, I think. That's I'm sorry, I think that camera angle is a little bad. This might be a little better here. So. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> yeah, there we go. And what year was that? That was five years ago. And he's got a little trash. He's got that little kicker coming off. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very cool deer. So, so yeah, definitely, uh, definitely looking forward to Kansas in a couple of weeks, you know, and as you know, we are getting some, some, some good weather here. So it's getting cold and. Oh yeah. I think the rut, the rut's going to kick in a little sooner than, uh, than we expected. Well, yeah. it's my buddies uh, who, who follows it pretty good. Um, you know, he said, um, the seventh, actually, Bill Winky had it on his on his site, uh, Midwest Whitetails. But anyway, he said the seventh, 
and then you take three days before and three days after. So you sort of kind of have the, yeah. Yeah. the third, the third to the to the tenth is is the prime time. Having said that, I yeah. know guys that you know they've seen they've seen buck you know uh, chasing already, and one had a breeding buck and doe on their trail camera. Oh no, kidding! Oh, that's that's super cool. That was like yeah. that was you know uh, Tuesday or whatever day it is. You know Tuesday or yeah. Wednesday. Yeah, no, um, and th- that's interesting that, you know, you're just sharing those dates with me. Unfortunately, I'm going to be out there just a little after that. My first day of hunting is on the 12th, so I'm a little later than I care to, and it's just because of my schedule. But uh, it seems like we're, we're pretty much out there in Kansas every year, right around that, just 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 the end of the first week of November, and it's it's all, it's been on pretty much every year at that time. So uh, I'd say uh, Bill Winkie's definitely spot on. That's, that's the dates I'd like to be there again. I'll be uh, there a few days later, so. So now, I'm sure it's going to be good. I'm sure crossbow good. hunting or, or, or compound or what kind of equipment you use? I uh, shoot, shoot a, shoot a PSC. And, and actually, I'm um, funny you ask that. I just got a new bow today. So I just, uh, I don't know the, the model, but it's their new carbon bow. Um, uh, my, my buddy, um, Brad Lockwood, he hosts uh, love of the hunt TV and he, um, we're sponsored by PSC and he has a bow shop out in Pennsylvania. And we went elk hunting three weeks ago and he brought the carbon bow and, uh, I, I was shooting the, um, Ah, uh, okay. That's that's terrible. I just drew a blank here. Um, ah, uh, I forgot the name of my bow. I'm getting old. Um, it's um, it's one of the jewelry bows. It's the, one of the dream season bows. But you know, wonderful bow, and and you know, shot it for several years, and then I put one arrow through this new carbon bow by PSC. And I'm like, wow, like really, really a game changer. Okay, let's talk about that. You're shooting good equipment, then all of a sudden you put something new in your hand, and you go, wow, was it smoothness? Was it you know? Then stack or, you know, help me understand and share with the listeners why, you know, what the game changer was. You know, I, it was really the smoothness and uh, the actually also the on uh, the let off with this carbon bow. It, um, uh, I'm not sure the exact specs of it, but the let off, um, you know, I'm, I'm getting a little bit older. I'm, I'm 55 now and kind of have issues with with lower back and just the, the torque of of holding a bow for a long period of time. Um, I think the let off is, is, it might be as high as 90%. And just when I pull back and that, that, uh, that value there right at the end, it's just, just effortless to hold the bow back. So, um, so now it's going to be a lot easier on my back and a lot more forgiving for me to shoot. And, um, you know, pretty much my first arrow, I shot a bullseye with it and it was like, wow. And <laughs> it sizes me. So we're exactly same draw length and everything. So shot an arrow. I'm like, yeah, this, this is a great bow. So uh-huh. it's actually in the box up, up front though. So I'm pretty, pretty excited to try it out. Do you have a range that works so you can put a hundred arrows in it before you leave? I do. I do. I'm uh, got it. Got three acres at home, so I've uh, got all kinds of 3D targets set up. So uh, I'll set up to launch arrows at home. But it's going to be cold tonight. You know that it's going to be in the 20s, possibly snow. Yeah, it's it started snowing at the house the other just just this afternoon. So yeah, <laughs> bring it. What well, dress warm? Dress warm. That's for sure. You know, listeners, we've been talking all about knives and gear a little bit about hunting but the biggest thing and and i want to share with everybody and and reiterate here with david is that you know you got a broadhead and they're super sharp and there's a gazillion broadheads out in the market you got fixed and mechanical and all this other but one thing they all have every single one of them has is they're deathly sharp because they got to go through a lot of stuff now strength wise and everything completely um that's a topic with a different person. But when I'm thinking about the blades for, for skinning and for gutting and for, you know, preparing it for the meal and all those things, that's probably the second most uh, important tool you have. One's your broadhead. You're going to launch it, put the deer down. Then you got to take it home. Uh, I mean, there's, you know, you got to cut it up. And if you take it to the processor, fine. But, but I've seen too many elk and I've been a, a few places that they just destroyed their caribou. I mean, they just destroyed it because one, they didn't have the right equipment, and two, maybe they should have learned how to do it a little bit better. But it was the equipment that really made the difference. And you know, so I, let's talk to that. You know, I think, um, and that's that's really hitting on a key key part of you know you know why we hunt and the whole process of it. You know, it's hunting is exciting. I mean, it's it's really being in touch with na- nature, being in the outdoors. You know, the whole outdoor experience and you know, I went elk hunting three weeks ago. I didn't get an elk. I never drew my bow, but I had an awesome hunt being out there in nature, being out in the in the woods of Colorado where the elk live. You know, I was in their territory, and it's 
it's not easy getting an elk down. But um, when you do get um, an animal, you're fortunate enough to harvest an animal, um, you know, it really, it's the best meat out there. You know, it's high protein, it's low fat, it's better than anything you buy in the store. And I've heard so much criticism that, yeah, I like hunting, but I just give the meat away. I don't like eating it. It's, it's kind of gamey. Well, I don't get the gamey part because the thing is, if you, it comes, it starts, it starts, as you said, once you arrow or, or shoot an animal, once the animal expires, the quality of the meat starts right there. And it starts with proper field dressing. And then once you get the meat home, it, it, it's processing the meat correctly. So, um, so yeah, let's, let's definitely talk about that. So I think, uh, you know, one of the things is, is uh, once the animal's down, once he's expired, bacteria starts forming immediately. And, and heat um, is what rapidly grows bacteria. So it's very important to field dress quickly once the animal expires and field dress correctly. You know, do the field dressing process correctly where, you know, you have something like, like a gutting blade like this where you can get inside and not pierce the, the bladder, not pierce the stomach. Don't get any of the internal um, juices or viscera on, on the meat. So get the insides out as quickly as you can, get them out cleanly. And by doing so, you're, you're taking all that heat, all that mass of heat of the internal organs out. Then you're opening the animal, allowing it, it for cooling. So, so that's another thing skinning does. By removing the hide, you're exposing the meat for cooling. Um, so rapidly cool the animal. The, the actual, uh, the FDA um, is basically, they say 41 degrees. Anything over 41 degrees, bacteria uh, grows rapidly. So get your meat cooled down to um, 41 degrees or lower. Um, and then, uh, you know, some people are fans of aging. Uh, so aging is kind of a topic in itself. Um, I've had plenty of deer that I've, I've skinned them, processed them, butchered them, and froze them. They were, they were tender and they ate well. So, so aging tends to um, make the meat a little bit more tender. Um, it's basically a slow process where you keep the animal at 41 degrees between freezing and, and 41 and you age it. And basically the, um, uh, there's some bacteria process where the, it basically breaks down some of the muscle fibers and makes, supposedly makes the, uh, you know, Makes makes the meat more tender, but um, whether you age or not, I think it's not all that critical. Um, but um, once it comes to um, cutting up the meat, I think this is another thing that intimidates a lot of people. They they've never done it. They think it's difficult, and they don't have the right tools for it, so they just bring it to the butcher. You know what I enjoy about the hunt and process my own game is everything comes full circle. I I pursued the animal, I harvested the animal, I field dress it, and then I cut up the meat. I control the quality of the animal from the field to the freezer. I know exactly what I'm eating. I cut the portions of meat in the in the sizes and I wrap them the way I feed my family. And um, just a lot of gratification from doing that. You know, you learn, uh, you know, the basically the muscle structure, what each muscle is is best used for. And then um, I have my own grinder, so I make my own burger. And it just it's it's the best food out there. So um, so with that, you do need um, you know good knives to do the the process. So uh, that's one thing that Outridge does is um, we um, we make a variety of, of butchering kits, and this is our original one. We came out with this in 2001. It's called the Game Processor. And what it is, it's a complete set of knives and tools in a hard side carry case. So basically, you know, four uh, really practical knives for processing. You got a caping knife for detail work. You got your gut hook skinny knife, removing the hide, opening the animal. This right here is your bony knife, which is basically the workhorse for any butcher. It's a, it's a flexible knife, but this is basically for deboning, cutting all the meat off the bones. And then when it comes to carving steaks and cutting any large pieces of meat, we have an eight inch butcher knife. So a great, great knife for cutting steaks with. So also, um, you know, you got a uh, full-size cutting board underneath. You got game shears, a saw, a carving fork, um, a sharpener, and a, this is really a cool item that Alfred makes. And we talked about cooling, you know, bringing that body temperature down. This is called our skill stick. And what you do is you saw through the chest, set it on both sides and pop that in position. So basically spreads the chest open, that allows better airflow for, for cooling the animal. So, so this is our original and most complete home processing set. So basically you have all the tools you need all together in a hard case. So the only limitation in this kit is it, it weighs six pounds. It's it's not something you take, honey. You kind of leave it at home. And I'll show you. Uh, we we make actually four four or five different butcher kits, but this is our our latest one, and I'll give you a little size comparison. You know, this is six pounds. This is uh, basically one point six pounds. So this is something that you can actually carry in your in your day pack. 
And again, a complete frosting kit with a taping knife, gut hook skinner, and your boning knife. And it also has that that sharpener, the the sharp axe I told you about before. So there's your there's your sharpener with the pivoting base. So you got all the knives and you got the sharpener to keep the edge on them. So um, really a really a handy kit. So with that, um, you know, you really have all the tools you need to process the animal. I know um, people are intimidated, but really, if you go online, we also, we used to um, sell a series of DVDs by Brad Lockwood, our, our TV show host, and he, he really gives you all the expert information how to process the animal. The, the DVDs are still available, but really, you can just go on YouTube, and there's all kinds of experts out there showing you how to cut up your meat and, and do the process. So, um, and it really isn't that bad. Really, you have all your primary muscles and they're all separated by that silver skin and fascia and just kind of work them apart. And, and, uh, you know, I, you know, another thing that I say too, is when you bring a, your meat into the butcher, the way that I cut meat, I take so much time. and I'm so meticulous about trimming and removing the silver skin. They're doing it as a job to make money. They can't make money cutting meat the way that I do because it does take, take so long the way that I do it. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's what I eat, it's what I feed my family. So it's, it's really important to me that it's done, it's done correctly. Hey, let's share <laughs> your one big thing about hunting, and you can't say the knife that you bring, so it's got to be something else <laughs> yeah, than yeah, your it's, knife. It's too much talk about knives. <laughs> but the one big thing that you, you know, um, elk hunting, deer hunting, um, traveling someplace else to hunt something else, but, um, you know, what's your one big thing, your go-to thing that on every trip you either bring along or you make sure you do? Got to be the bow. Um, you don't get anything done without that. Was that? I don't know if that was a good answer. Um, no, I, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. It's yours. <laughs> everybody has everybody has one big thing, and by um, default, yeah. yours is a, yours is a blade. So we can't go there. Yeah, yeah. So um, um, yeah. I think the main thing is is bringing a bringing a, a good attitude to just enjoy, you know, uh, God's creation and, and enjoying the outdoors and just just being out there. I mean, you know, the thing is is uh. As, as adults, as, as a, when I was a kid, I, I went to, you know, the Boy Scouts and Cub Scouts, and we went camping a lot. And now as an adult, I, I really don't get to go camping much. So so hunting for me is my time to be a kid again. When I climb in that tree, I, actually, before I even climb in the tree, you know, just walking in, in the dark towards the stand, you know, the hair stands up on the back of my head. It's just that excitement, that kid-like feeling that it's, how do you describe it? You know, how do you describe it to someone that doesn't hunt? Like I... I just get so excited just walking to the stand and just seeing seeing the sunrise and seeing does come in and seeing younger bucks that I pass on come underneath the tree and just you know seeing nature at its finest up close and personal. So what I bring to the woods is is a good attitude to uh, to just soak up all that all that good nature. It's there's nothing like it. It's the best thing on earth. Well, David, I really enjoyed um, getting together. I know we, we had fit your schedule which i'm fine with but this has been a joy and listeners i hope you heard some of this yeah you get a lot of technical information you get a lot of reasons how why when but that blade that you put in your hand can make the difference of a great meal or just a what happened here type of meal and and it makes your job easier there's no question about it so on behalf of thousands of listeners across north america david block thank you so much for being a guest on whitetail rendezvous Thank you, Bruce, and uh, good luck in the deer woods. Uh, you're getting ready to head off, and uh, I want to see some good pictures there. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.